You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, welcome again to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. This is episode 3270, Living Underneath the... uh, 2020 pandemic. Uh, is it really? Has it been that long? No, we're still in June. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> How's everyone doing this week? I hope, I hope you are all surviving well, wherever you find yourself. Uh, you know, if it wasn't enough in 2020 for us to have a pandemic, now, no, now, now we are in the land of chaos and protest. And it has been an uh, up and down week, um, if I'm going to be honest, with where we are at. But I, I believe that we are moving towards an area that is quite beautiful. Um, as we've been kind of participating and watching amongst all the protesters, listening to conversations that are having that, that weren't necessarily happening before. There, this is a potentially, potentially hopeful moment Um, A potentially watershed moment as we're seeing the conversation move in a good direction. And and through all of this uh, protest, through all of this crying out, it's it's easy to see kind of two things in in America. And it's one of them is that there are there are people in our country, citizens and non-citizens, that are hurting. And I think that part is true. I do not feel like we are living on the equal playing field. So, yes. So I think that, one, there are people hurting in America. Two, that we have a lot of people that are in America that are still in denial and wanting to roll things back to the way things used to be. And they're having a hard time with progress that is happening. And, and in, in these times when we're really trying to figure out like what to do with this, how to process this, where, where, what do we do? Because there is, there's a lot of change happening and it's exciting. Um, there's a lot of same oldness and disgustingness happening and that's to be expected from, but, but really how, how do we begin to move forward? And as we kind of begin the show, the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about an alternative version, more of the kingdom of God version of of how we look at and handle and wrestle with power. And we're going to continue with that today as we talk deeper about kind of the, the, weird, the weird dance and relationship that power and vulnerability have. And we're going to be talking a little bit deeper later in the hour about why we've kind of forgotten the vulnerability part and just leaned hard on the power part to where like the systems that we are seeing that are squishing and crushing people of color in America. Today, we are able to see that, that the power without vulnerability is just brutality. So we're going to be talking about systems of power in, in, in the shadow of all of the craziness that has gone on this last week. And to begin this, I, um, I'm going to begin by quoting some some of the solid words and how to process through this. Uh, this comes from um, Jim Wallace from Sojourners Magazine. And the title of his article, which I just think is, is a beautiful place to start, um, and I feel like this is where we need to begin our show, this is where we need to end our show too, um, saying this, um, the article's title, Prayer is Essential, Protest is Required, and Policy is Necessary. I'm going to say those again. Prayer is essential, protest is required, policy is necessary. Now, much of what is going to frame our conversation this week is, what's the best way for me to put this? Uh, Donald Trump's little photo op um, that involved police brutality against 
peaceful protesters in order to get his widow picture holding a Bible he's never opened up, holding it in a way that no human that has ever held a Bible has held it uh, in front of a church to be able to have a picture, to be able to send to his base so they would say, hey, we're cool. You're holding the Bible. We're that stupid and easy to be pandered to. All we need is a picture of you holding a book that may or may not even be the Bible. I don't know. It could be like Fifty Shades of Grey, the leather edition, the black leather edition. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. His base, it doesn't take much to throw them a little treat and they're happy. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. tear gas and protesters, throw a few flashbangs in there. Get old uh, orange chubby out there to hold a book up in front of a church that's boarded up. And there, there you've had it. You've done your little bit to tantalize the evangelicals and conservatives for another month. Go back to the oppression of people. Continue on, people. No, but in, uh, in Wallace's article, um, well, I'm just going to go ahead and read uh, a couple paragraphs out of it. And this is from June 4th. So again, realize we're a couple days off. Uh, he says this. He says, yesterday in Washington, D.C., up against police lines protecting the White House, Sojourners partnered with the Episcopal Diocese and others for a, quote, solitary prayer vigil. Just up the street from St. John's, Lafayette Square, where on Monday, militarized police tear gassed and removed peaceful protesters from all around Lafayette Park and the church. Donald Trump did that so he could stride over for a photo op in front of a church building lifting a Bible over his head while having nothing to say, using both the sacred space of a church and our Holy Scripture as political props. The whole nation and the world have now seen that infamous picture, and many have noted that the Bible was held upside down, both literally and indeed all of its teachings. And there in front of the historical pale yellow sanctuary known as the Church of the Presidents, Trump was asked if the Bible he was holding was his own. And he answered, it's a Bible. And asked if he had any thoughts, Trump said, I'm not going to do the impression, but we have a great country. That's my thoughts. The greatest in the world. We will make it greater. We will make it even greater. It won't take long. It's not going to take long. You see what's going on. You see it's coming back. And I feel like this is, we are in the place of a tale of two countries um, that we find ourselves within. We have part of our country that is on fire, um, that is frustrated uh, because it has been marginalized for too long. It has been abused for too long. We have others that are standing up um, for those people that are crying out that this oppression needs to end. And then we have the others that continue to say, <laughs> business as usual. Just take a picture and throw it to your followers. That picture will do it. That'll make them happy. Because evangelicals and conservatives are that stupid. Not in the article. That's me just assuming what they're all thinking in the White House. Because guess what? Evangelicals and conservatives. If Trump taking a picture in front of a church is what makes you guys hard, this is a really sad state. It's worse than I thought. It's worse. It's worse. It's worse. Because the article continues saying this, the vigil yesterday, led by Bishop Marianne Budd of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, Robert Fisher, rector of the St. John's, and many other clergy and bishops took place as a thousand of mostly young people diverse across faiths and ethnicities were exercising their power to protest. And I've never in my life um, seen so many white people care so deeply about America's original sin, structural racial injustice and the 400 years of violence against black lives. And following the lead from their black brothers and sisters to voice that concern to the police and the military and all the political leaders behind them. A moment of something that was beautiful. Now there have, there have been, there has been violence in writing. A lot of it that we're seeing is instigated by the police right now, which is a totally different conversation, but really does fit into our conversation about power and vulnerability. Because we've seen many police forces across the country exercising power without vulnerability, humility, or anything else. And that, and that is only brutality. So we have seen the power of vulnerability as people go and protest, and then we've seen the power of brutality, which is some people's version of what power should look like. 
Usually weak little men. Weak little men that have problems with the size of their you-know-whats are the ones that tend to have a problem with brutality because they want to take other people and make them feel less than so that they can feel more. And that, and that, and that is also white privilege and why we continue to have these problems. Years and years and years, and the sins of America continue on. But I like this. Um, Atlanta Mayor Akeisha Lance Bottoms said this about injustice and the protesters. She said, the only thing I know to do is be true to who I am. And by that, I mean I have to articulate my pain. I have to articulate my frustration and anger. And I think that is what, that is what so many people across this country have wanted to do for so long. So when I hear Secretary Mattis speak out against Donald Trump, that's what we have been looking for and asking for. People of good conscience to say, I know you are hurting and I may not have understood it, uh, understood it on yesterday, but I get it today. And I'm not silent anymore. And let me say that again. This is what the people of color in America are seeking in many ways. First, to be able to do this, yes. For people of good conscience to be able to say, I know that you're hurting. And I may have not understood it on yesterday, but I get it today and I will not be silent anymore. Because we can't be silent anymore. We can't be silent anymore. When we see our brothers and sisters living a life much different than the rest of us, where they live a life of fear, where they live a life of being oppressed, and they live a life where they are worried about the power structures in this country coming crashing down upon their way of life. It is a very difficult place to be. It is a very, very difficult place for us to be. And at the same time, when we're talking about structures of power, this totally unrelated, but I also feel like totally related. Um, I was reading an article. Uh, it was involving, it was, it was an article about movies. And um, they were asking James Cameron about why he, now let's think back. Sorry, I know I transitioned. That was like a hard left on you guys. Okay. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to fit. It's going to fit. It's going to fit. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. So they asked James Cameron, the movie director James Cameron, Avatar, uh, T1, T2, the good T's. Um, <laughs> so they asked him why, why he made a cop the villain in Terminator 2. Robert Patrick played like this, I don't know, what was he, like a liquid metal monster that was trying to kill Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah. But he asked why did he make a white cop the villain? And that's... Okay. So here's what James Cameron said. The Terminator films are not really about the human race getting killed off by future machines. They're about us losing touch with our own humanity and becoming machines, which allows us to kill and brutalize each other. Cops think of all non-cops as less than they are. Stupid, weak, and evil. They, dehuman they dehumanize the people they are sworn to protect and desensitize themselves in order to do that job. I think, I think that speaks very deeply to the mind. Not, not to the mind, to the reality of what we are dealing with today. That in many ways, and I'm not saying all, I'm not saying all, I'm not saying all, but I think in many ways, a lot of this bro power culture that, that, that we have ascribed, and we've really put this mantle on police officers, which I think in many ways is unfair. Um, that we've given them as much broad power or broad scope for what they do. But I'm just going to read that again. Cops think of all non-cops as less than they are, stupid, weak, and evil, and they dehumanize the people they are sworn to protect and desensitize themselves in order to do that job. And I think in a very broad perspective, that is very, very true. And... It is a very, very interesting and difficult place to find ourselves at um, in history. I mean, it's difficult 
because it's so easy to see how we've not really progressed very much since the civil rights movement. It's, it's interesting to see that how we have had certain progress in the light, that there's been certain, hmm, what's the right word? Certain festering in the dark. Because all the while, that in many ways, in the light, we've been seeing progress and new things happening and a greater equality. But there's always the dark side. There's always the dark side to America. It's those voices that have been laid into the darkness. It's, it's those things that Trump came in and started like unearthing, pulling up rocks and trying to see what was underneath. And oh, 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 what was underneath? It's not pretty. And we were able to see, oh my gosh, hmm. Mm. And the area of political correctness, while it has been good for public discourse, the people that don't speak politically correct, that speak hateful speech, that speak about people in dehumanizing terms, oh, they just do that in the quiet now. They just learned that it, it doesn't oftentimes matter. Or it's actually, <laughs> they can't do it in public, so they have to do it in private. And that now we've seen in someone like Trump coming out, he's given them the power He's given them the platform to continue to speak and spew hate. And that is a really kind of scary place that we find ourselves in. Or, 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 uh, as we're kind of talking through this, this time of police brutality and also a president who is a little man who needed a photo op to make his base happy. Or as my friend Chris Kratzer liked to put it, because there's really no better way to put this, Trump has serious small dick energy. That's right, Trump has small dick energy. Because this photo op that he used, that he used riot control to clear a crowd of protesters to get to, all came about because he was worried that he was being mocked for hiding in the White House bunker when the protest began. So this is a little man acting like a little man, but being upset that everyone else saw that he was a little man. And now he's got to look like a big man. Mm -hmm. Because we're still in middle school. We're still in middle school and that's still where we're at. So this is crazy. What's happening. This is also hopeful with a lot of the protesting and, and hopeful conversations that are happening in America. But before we get to talking about our main story, power and vulnerability today, um, we're going to try to see some of the Christian response to all that's going on right now in our segment called The Christian Crazy. So here we go. Claude, have mercy. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. <laughs> So just a reminder that the Christian crazy is here for us to be able to see the insanity that is Christianity in America. So hopefully, hopefully, once we can see past the crazy, we can somehow way down there, way over yonder, somehow see Jesus, maybe, on the horizon. He's quite away from American Christianity these days. I think that's him. Hopefully it's him. All right. Well, well, first in the Christian crazy, I'm going to talk about the Southern Baptist Church. What? What? I know, I know. Such a bastion of hope and truth and... Yeah, I can't even string that whole sentence together lying about them. No, no, no. A bastion of narrow-minded thinking, hate, bigotry, and misogyny. That Southern Baptist Church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So here's what I like. So we've got the leader of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Reverend Albert... Moeller Jr. Now, to show you what kind of strong character this man is, he's a man that in 2016 said evangelicals should not support Donald Trump, but has recently done a total 180, and now he's okay with it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How does that happen? I don't. Oh, it's really just called pandering to those so you can keep in power. Yeah, we've kind of already covered that. So, good. So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here's what, here's what Mueller had to say about Trump's little photo op. All right. So here's his main issue. Here is his main issue with the photo op. He says this, I'm quoting from him. Finally, as we're thinking about the spectacle, 
there were ironies abounding. One of them is the the, uh, theological character of St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. It's a very liberal church and a very liberal denomination. Episcopal Church in the United States has been increasingly moved itself to the far left of American theology and American public life. And then he goes on to talk about, oh, it's been openly affirming of LGBTQ. And you could just go through the list of issues of liberal activism for a matter of decades. So again, okay, I like how he punts on this one. He punts on this one because I grew up a Baptist. This is how they're Baptist. And Baptists like to rip on every other denomination because they see themselves as superior. They dry hump the Bible better than everybody else dry humps the Bible. They love Jesus more than everyone else. And everyone else, eh, <laughs> probably going to hell. I don't know. God may grade on a curve, but you better be Southern Baptist just in case. So yes, I love the SBC and how they're responding to this. Really, it gives them an opportunity <laughs> to just rip on another church. Great. This healing and unity, let's move towards it, right? Oh, wait. How can Christians call for unity in America if even our faith cannot have unity? Interesting. That's a whole other conversation for another time. <laughs> oh, but we are we are neck deep here in the Christian crazy, and there's there's more crazy to go around. So don't worry, don't worry. If you came hungry for some crazy, you're gonna go home with a doggy bag of crazy. Because next up we've got Robert Jeffress, pastor of First Baptist Dallas, and he's totally fine with this because hey, George Washington would have done the exact same thing. George Washington was very big on photo ops. So what do you make to the, you know, to the critics who say the president shouldn't have had a photo op with this Bible, including the Reverend Al Sharpton at services today? Well, I imagine George Washington had his share of critics who accused him of a photo op when he knelt down in prayer uh, at Valley Forge. A <laughs> Good one. Good one. Valley Forge. <laughs> He's literally talking about a painting, a painting of George Washington. And I'm pretty sure back in the days, paintings weren't necessarily selfies where George Washington is like, <laughs> here, get my good side. It's going to take several hours. No, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, Robert Jeffers is doing what Robert Jeffers does as saying everything Trump does is fine. He's kind of like Jesus. Right? Right? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. But you know what? But you know what? Rick Wiles just loved this. So from True News, this was this was like Rick Wiles his best day ever. Like best day ever. A very uh um historical moment tonight. You'll remember this for many many years. You'll remember the night the president of the United States bravely walked out of the White House and went to a church that had almost burned down last night because of the leftist communist movement. And the president held up the Holy Bible. He signaled to the whole world that his faith is in God. Rick's right. Trump did it. He was a military force to gas a bunch of protesters just so he could hold up a Bible that wasn't even his own Bible. waiting for such a beautiful human transparent moment Trump really loves God he loves him so much <laughs> and I rejoice in this I rejoice this is the moment I've waited to see in Donald Trump doc this is what I've waited to see I, I, I'm not happy that this is what it took but I've waited four years to see Donald Trump sincerely express his faith in God. And I really believe that was sincere tonight. He knows that without God, not only is he in grave tr trouble and danger, but he knows that the nation is in grave trouble and danger. And you know more importantly what we've learned from this is Trump's base 
is way dumber than I thought they were. Like, if this, if this is what Rick Wiles has been waiting for. Oh, I've been waiting for so long, Lord. <laughs> Trying to hold up a Bible. <laughs> Just gets me right here. Oh, historic. <laughs> what? How low is your bar? <laughs> how low? Well, William Barr is pretty low. But how low is your bar? This is so insane. This is, oh, wait, I'm sorry. That was insane. And this, this, next up here with Kurt Landry. Oh, oh, this is just nuts. So <laughs> if you thought this was showing how stupid a lot of Trump's base is, <laughs> wait till you hear this. We're in a war. A lot of people don't want to say that. We, we are in a major spiritual war, but we're also in a war with the far left and the right, and there's globalists and one world government and progressives, and we're in a war. So we're in a war with, uh, so A, it's a spiritual war. B, it's a war with the far left and the right. It's also a war with globalists and a one world government and a war with progressives. Hmm. Like, if I've learned anything, if I learned anything in my high school education, it was that usually when it comes to world wars, you two front wars don't work. And by my definition here, let's see, spiritual war, left and right, global, this is like a five front war you have going on here. This is just not wise. Like, like abort, abort, oh, 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 oh. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> that's a trigger word, abort. We'll get to your guys' obsession with aborting things later. <laughs> okay, but this is not, I don't think this is going to end well, Kurt, but just, you know, Kurt, go ahead, keep going, buddy, keep going. And if you don't think we're not in a, in a world war, I'm not calling it that, but the war is that world because what's happening, the attack against Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel and what you see against the attack against Donald Trump it's the same plan, the same narrative, the same things. It's all about trying to waste time and not allow these men to do what they're called to do and what they're hired to do and voted in to do. Just because these men have been involved in like vast amounts of corruption and only really caring about themselves and, and making more money for themselves. I mean, that's the only reason people are upset about this. Come on, isn't that what politicians are all about, right? Right? I don't know. And, and, and I have to say this to you as a spirit, spiritual elder, whatever label you want to call me, whatever, whatever I am in your life. Oh, oh, are we having a moment here? Is this a tender moment of Kurt? What do you mean to me? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Like we are talking about vulnerability today. I'll be vulnerable. I just think that you are the horrible human being, Kurt. I think that you are pandering your faith. To a man that is so unchristlike, it is startling. It startles me that you've actually claimed to have read even portions of the Bible and continue to wholeheartedly put your faith and support and everything that you have ministry-wise behind Trump. <laughs> Such a weird idea. Such. But I'm glad you asked me. Yeah, yeah, whatever you are to me, which, which, which. Are you getting the picture here? You getting the picture here, Kurt? Getting it? Getting it, get it? Do I need to just a little? No, no. I think you get it. I hope you get it. If not, I don't want to have to say it. I won't say it. It's not much, Kurt. It's not much. And I know I had alluded to abortion before, and the conservatives' obsession with abortion, because really, in the evangelical conservative world. Most paths lead to abortion. You can bring up something else. Oh, racism in America. <laughs> what about abortion? Income inequality. What about abortion? War. What about abortion? <laughs> Should we have pineapple on pizzas? I don't know. What about abortion? That's just, they're really kind of a, uh, yeah, a one trick pony when it comes to this. And you know what? Gordon Klingenschmidt is going to do the same thing as he was having a discussion about all of this, about all this that's going on within racial reconciliation and how do we heal our nation? Abortion? 
Yeah, I didn't think that was a good answer either. The righteous anger in in the black community who is obviously deeply offended. I'm angry. You're angry. Um, these cops should be tried. They should not get away with murder. Uh, and yet, Planned Parenthood has killed 360,000 black babies uh, in 2014 and similar numbers in other years. Ah, Gordon, just go ahead and fuck off. Seriously. I li- like if, if you wanted to find a de- definition of what like giving lip service to something looks like, it's what Gordon just did. Sure, it's terrible what's happening to the black community. Police brutality is awful, right? We can kind of all, but let's get to the main idea, abortion. Really? Does every, every road in conservative Christianity lead to abortion? Because that's an entirely different conversation, which also does involve income inequality and issues of health care. But you don't want to have that, do you? <laughs> no, you don't, because that would require something of you, conservative Christianity, to be able to help people in lower income areas to actually just get health care, general health care. But that's not your thing. You'd rather just deride people and scream, abortion! Yeah. But that's your thing. That's your thing. You got one thing. You know, you're the only kid. Your your talent is playing the triangle. Well, there, Johnny, just play the triangle. That's what God made you to do. I'm joking. There is no abortion triangle. But you know, it's not a joke. The fact that I'm going to kind of agree with Kenneth Copeland. I mean, kind of, but it still makes me feel pretty dang dirty. Yeah. All right, Ken, go ahead. You demon-eyed, money-grubbing, creepy motherfucker. Something that is equally pathetic is people that don't vote. This is the mightiest country on the face of the earth. And it is extremely important that we vote and do it according to the leading of the Spirit of God. Well, yeah. Vote based upon what you think is the most morally right choice for the country moving forward. Gosh, interesting. Yeah. Kenneth Copeland. Really? We should vote our heart. We should vote our heart and our consciousness for the for the kingdom of God. Like we want to vote our conscience to be able to help the marginalized people and help those that don't have a voice. Is that what you're talking about? Oh my gosh, this is incredible. We're we're really not agreeing on what we're saying here, but it just sounded like we did for a moment. All right, I'll celebrate. The minor parties in life. Woohoo! All right, back to you, creepy dude. That ballot is your seed. You did what you believed was right, and God will treat you the entire time that that person is in office, whether it's the governor, the president, or a senator, or a congressman, whomever it is. You need to vote in every race, not just the presidential race. And, and when we say every race, we only mean vote the white race. That's, that's the one that God loves the most. Because when you, when you vote, you get blessed. I mean, if your man wins an office, God will bless you. If you if you lose, your man loses an office, well, well, I'm assuming that's just going to be punishment. But, but it's all about blessing because voting's about sowing your seed. <laughs> you got to get that seed in the earth and get it down. Okay, sorry. sorry. I feel dirty too. Probably just as dirty as you feel hearing me talking like Kenneth Copeland. It's disturbing. It's terrible. Yeah, so all I can say is, yay, Kenneth Copeland's telling people to vote, but that voting's gonna somehow blah, I mm, Let's not even make this spiritual. I just think it's a good human idea to go and vote for people that aren't terrible to all people. Hmm, public service announcement. Because just as Kenneth Copeland was telling us to be able to vote what we believe the Lord is telling us to do as we vote. I've, I, he's really making this creepier and weirder than needs to be. Vote, yeah, our conscience. But, you know, if you needed this, if you needed this, because Christians out there need to hear something that we got. It's called a testimony. That's right. In the circles of Christianity, your testimony is everything. How what has God done for your life, son? What has he done? How has he moved in you? How has he changed you, son? 
And at this time, when we're talking about voting for the most godly, we should hear from our president about what God is doing in his life, how God is changing him. And of course, it's wonderful that he sat down with a man that he is essentially demasculated, debased, and de a lot of other things too. John Spicer. It's surprising this guy still exists or has any shrug of dignity left, but considering the fact that he's interviewing and kissing up to his old boss and fired him, dignity is something that Sean left miles ago. But let's go ahead and listen to Sean asking the hard-hitting questions about Trump, talking about his testimony and how God's moving in his heart, because apparently this all is all that matters when it comes to voting. And just pay attention to how long Trump stays on target with this question. I think you know the answer is not at all. Since you've been president, have you grown in your faith? Do you pray? Do you pray often? Yeah. You, you've talked a lot about religion this week. What does it mean yeah. to you? So I think maybe I have, from the standpoint that I see so much that I can do, I, I've done so much for religion. The Johnson Amendment, getting rid of a Mexico City. Nobody thought any of this stuff would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and cut you off there, Mr. President, because we realize that the only kind of salad you like is word salad, and it's only going to get worse from that point with Trump trying to talk bad about the Democrats and uh, the horrible Russia mm -hmm, hoax and everything. So, yeah, how's Trump's faith doing? <laughs> Just look, idiots. The economy... <laughs> Supreme Court justices Because <laughs> that's my relationship with God <laughs> Oh Oh, evangelical Christianity What have you done? When exactly did you forget about Jesus? Like, I want to know about this With evangelicals and with, like, conservative Christians Like, at what point Actually, to a lot of American Christianities, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go with those. Like, when did you forget about Jesus? Like, when was the point? It was like, I feel like you're on vacation. You've got, like, a car full of kids, and you accidentally pulled out of the rest stop and didn't notice that little Tommy was not in the car. And you didn't notice for three hours. Yeah, it's kind of that bad. And, and Tommy is a baby he's a baby and you left him there and didn't notice him for three hours it's that bad christianity that we have somehow said jesus <laughs> i think he used to work here years ago i'm not really familiar with that name <laughs> i'm really just concerned with making this building bigger and better and bringing in the books right people that's that's really what this is about, huh? Right? Jesus. <laughs> I think he was a custodian we had here once. So all of that leads us. I mean, all of the crazy. We finally, we made it through the forest of insanity. Now look, it's an open field. And as I mentioned at the top of the hour here, this we're journeying through in this hour, that this is a continuing conversation we've been having over the past few weeks on what power and leadership should look like within the Jesus or Christian context. What, what were the systems of power? What, what, what did Jesus tell us? What did Jesus inform us in the New Testament about what the kingdom of God looks like? So we've been doing this. We've been going through um, bit by bit from a book called Tug of War, The Downward Ascent of Power, through one of my past professors, Wilmer Villacorta, um, from Fuller University or Fuller Seminary. And we've been having what's, what's been interesting through the conversations that we've been having through this. I feel like in real time, we're able to see issues of leadership, um, in America unfolding in front of us with all of the riots, with the way the governments are responding, with the way the police forces are responding. We, we, we responding, we, we see that there is a problem, a problem with the way that we hold and wield power in America. And and this, this, we're like episode, I don't know, I feel like we're like episode three or four in on a series discussing different facets and aspects of power and, and how, uh, how those should be wielded in more of a uh, compassionate and Jesus-like manner. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested and you're new to the show, you can catch us uh, this episode and all past episodes uh, at www.snarkyfaith.com or, 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 
where you listen to podcasts. Just look up Snarky Faith. It's that easy to catch up with us. Um, but if you haven't even listened to what we're talking about, I, I don't feel like you're going to have a problem sliding right into the conversation that we're going to have here for the rest of the show. And um, we're going to talk today a little bit more about this conundrum of power and about how, in, in a certain way, the, the kingdom of God that Jesus lays out, the systems of power that that he begins to speak of is something that you would look at as being a very upside down version of power. And I want to begin with this. It's a, it's, it's a good quote as we're uh, entering into this conversation by Andy Crouch. And he says this, our use of power will always be disordered and destructive, will result in idolatry and injustice unless we find a way to a restored relationship with the giver of power. And those words, too, I think resonate within me when we talk about these, these systems of injustice uh, and, and the words he used, disordered, destructive, and results in idolatry and injustice. And, and I feel like that, that is what we are dealing with very, very much today. We feel that. We feel that within the Black Lives Matter movement. We feel that within the protests right now, that, that the systems of power right now are very, very unjust and that things are out of balance. They are out of order. And, and especially when we begin to talk about how insane all of this is, this, this, this whole thing, not, not, not all of the protests, but, but the fact that there were peaceful protests in an area that the president wanted to be able to show, uh, uh, he wanted to be able to display a show of power and fondle a Bible just so his base would enjoy that. And they did. We've heard some about uh, 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 about that today. And even others, and even others, there was an article that just struck me. It was from The Guardian called, He Wears the Armor of God, Evangelicals Hail Trump's Church Photo Op. And this is what got me when, when, when they were quoting someone else saying this. It, it was like a Jericho walk in some evangelical circles, referring to the bub- biblical book of Joshua, where God commanded the Israelites to walk seven times around the opposing city of Jericho whose walls then came crashing down. Now, there's a big difference uh, when we try to use Scripture to be able to back up things like this. Uh, was Jericho in power, or were is, was Israel in power at this time? Like, wh- where was the systems of, of dominance Where was the systems of injustice? Well, if you're looking to the Old Testament, this time it was Jericho. And and, and one of the responses to Jericho was God being able to humble Jericho and bring down those walls. And in this situation, who who has the power? Oh, so the president has the power? Like, I feel like, like if you were to use this as a scenario of Jericho, it would almost be like the president making another wall, another outer wall around Jericho, and then making sure those walls fall down on the protesters. Now, so far, we've already had the president, who's such a tough guy, make another fence, steel structure, and wall around the White House because he's, of course, not scared. And people that are not scared like more and more fencing. That's usually how it works. That's generally how it works. Mm Mm-hmm. 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 So yeah, so yeah, so 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 let's not just try to disguise the fact that any of this, that any of this that we're talking about today, has anything to do with God. Because the whole reason that I feel like I'm even going through this is because the path of spirituality that we are talking about here, that we've been talking about for the past couple weeks on the show, the path of spirituality is not about systems of domination. It's not about systems that force themselves onto other people. Um, the, the, the kingdom of God is about a reverse system. Where the first are last and the last are first. Where the poor matter. Where the poor and those that are under the thumb of the empire matter. Matter. Now, I'm going to quote directly from the book that we're kind of talking through a little bit, Tug of War. And um, here, uh, the author is talking about Anne Dillard. And, he's, and, and through her work, offering a different, a different path of vital spirituality. And it goes like this. And I think this is what we also need to hear. Drawing from feminine spirituality, um, Anne Dillard asserts that the spiritual journey 
deals with how one assimilates the effects of power as it relates to productivity, success, and significance. She suggests, she suggests that the, the arena of traditional male spirituality, that there is little room for downward orientation. The assumption that the spiritual leaders must always be on their guard, always ready to divide and conquer, nurturing an upward orientation, always on the move and into something else. This idea gives little room for vulnerability. So others cannot see what is within. Because the inward way of spirituality can be threatening to a leader's sense of control. And the upward pull and outward push become the primary trait of the spiritual leader. So the upward pull and the outward push become that of a leader that is not operating out of vulnerability. And we see this. We see the hypocrisy in this ridiculous situation where the evangelicals and conservatives are heralding Trump as this is a wonderful display of leadership. But we're able to see this. This is just like a little man, a little man, a little man trying to assert power. Because one of the problems, and, and I think that this comes within just the way that the church has, has transformed probably over the past 50 to 100 years, where we don't want to be seen as not successful. We don't want to deal with loss. And when we look at the Bible, there's constantly, we constantly see the fact that loss and hardships can change us and teach us. It's part of the human journey. It, if we lean into that, that loss, that vulnerability, it actually teaches us to be a more loving and caring and humble and empathetic human being. And if we only care about winning, if the spiritual life is only about winning, then it looks nothing different than the materialistic, capitalistic life that we see being played out. So we have Trump who is held up as a leader of virtue, for of the faith, but everything he stands for looks nothing like Jesus. We have lost the plot, and we need to regain it. And, and this idea of vulnerability or being open to dealing with loss or when things don't go our way, it, it, it is a very, very strong narrative that, that is seen most eloquently in the Gospels through the cross. And Villacorta continues um, saying this about the cross. Although we understand the underlying truth of the cross, we often reduce it to our cultural self-preserving and self-enhancing perspectives. Among these is the avoidance of suffering, an illusion that we must acknowledge it at all costs, facing up to the fear of failure and seeing it as a valuable step in our inner formation coheres with the centrality of the cross. Jesus invites us to share our, in his sufferings to deal with our frenzied efforts towards temporary success and to align our lives with the transformational power of vulnerability. Jesus shows us this walk of suffering, of powerlessness. I mean, in, in the whole narrative of, of Christ, it's the idea that God chooses, that God chooses to show up as a flawed, vulnerable, small human being to be able to display his message to humanity. And it's all about this upside down logic of God that we are seeing perfected through Jesus. We're reminded of this when Paul says this in like 2 Corinthians 12, 19, where it said that my power is perfected in weakness. So yes, 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 yes. The walk of Christianity The walk of Christianity is one that isn't always supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be a paradox. Or, or as Richard Ward puts it, because none of us 
desire a downward path to growth through imperfection, seek it or even suspect it. We have to get the message with the authority of a divine revelation. So Jesus makes it into the central axiom that the, <clears throat> that the last really do have a head start. Love that. <laughs> mm. So Jesus makes it into the central axiom that the last really do have a head start in moving towards first. And those who spend too much time trying to be first will never get there. And Jesus says this clearly in several places and throughout numerous parables. So as we are in this place of protest, of pain, of lament, of outrage, just realize that it puts us right there with God. God is the God of the suffering. God is the God of the forgotten. God is the God of those that the empire does not care about. And throughout the scriptures, we see this, that Jesus speaks out against the power structures that are evil, that are maniacal, that seek to steal the humanity and rape the earth around us. We are in a place that is a very uncomfortable place to be in. If you are a person of color living in America, you have been there already. You have lived life there in that uncomfortable place. For many of us that live uh, under the privilege of whiteness in America, some of us are finally just waking up now. And guess what? If you're waking up now, great. Maybe you wish you woke up earlier. But you know what? We're glad to have you here. We are glad to have you here. Because... In order to be able to heal this mess, it's not going to take a Bible photo op to make a bunch of white people happy, to heal this mess of inequality and injustice and, and systemic injustice. It is going to take us being able to embrace powerlessness as a position of power, as antithetical as that may seem. So I'm going to ask you and challenge you, challenge myself. Where do you need to be powerless this week? Like, where do you need to be awake enough to God's spirit as you move out into the world? Now, <laughs> some people that are still staying at home in a quarantine, well, that may take on a different look for those that are out protesting, for those that actually have to show up to go to work, for those people that are out there in the world. My question continues to be, where are you being called to show vulnerability? Because vulnerability is power. And as much as our president wants to be seen as a big man who's important and such a big man, we realize that in his efforts, he's actually a small man. He's a small man with a very small sense of humanity. But you, you are who I care about. Those that are listening, those that are trying to make this world a better place. So let us continue to challenge ourselves. Let's continue to push ourselves, to push each other to be better. To ask those questions about where am I living out of spots of privilege? Where do I need to give up my positions of power? Where do I need to hand the microphone over to someone else? And I hope to do that on the show over the next few weeks. But I really, I really... I really want us to continue to focus in on what really matters. And we know that when all black lives matter, when all brown lives matter, when all LGBTQ lives matters, then all lives matters, right? 
But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But that is our aspiration, that everyone has a voice, that everyone has a seat at the table, that everyone is allowed to have the human dignity that is God-given, and that we, that we are never a people that get in the way of people finding their dignity, finding their identity, finding their voice, and finding that they matter, that they are important, and that they are loved. So this week, let us find ways to get out of the way, to be vulnerable and to help others. And that is all I've got this week. I send you out with the holiest amount of grace and snark and peace. And I hope that you can go and make a difference in wherever you're at, even if it's little. Difference is difference. Have an amazing week. And... I'm out of here. I'll catch you guys again next week. Peace.